I know, I know. No, I was thinking like live from New York City. (laughs) 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 Oh man. All right. Well, as he said, live from Austin. Uh, I'm Eric. I'm with Air Performance Services of Central Texas. Um, I am the senior, one of the senior system specialists in our building automation department. Uh, today we are going to briefly glaze over some topics that pertain to air conditioning. Um, our topic for today is typical types of cooling systems that we see in Austin and typical types of chill water systems we see in Austin. Um, we'll keep this fairly high level, but we will dive in deeper if we have time. Any questions? No questions. I like questions, man. Come on. I like conversing. But you're supposed to have questions already. Are you sure, though? Am I? (laughs) All right. Um, uh, Basically, the first thing I'll talk about, uh, just a single zone DX or split system. um, Sorry, DX split or package system. Um, Typical staged cooling. Nothing real special there, you know like a household unit, simple, small office retail space. Um, Space temp gets above your set point, you engage cooling. Um, Space temp drops below set point, you disable cooling. Pretty simple stuff there. Um, No real questions on that, right? Okay. Um, Next would be a little bit more in detail. We'll do uh, single zone water source heat pumps. So same basic theory and principle of operation for the cooling side of things. Uh, Most control systems, as your temperature gets beyond or close to set point, you will engage your cooling. Um, Depending on if it's a single stage or multi-stage, the further or closer you get to set point, you will stage up and down. Um, The one thing you have to consider when you have a water source heat pump in our applications is the condenser loop side of things. Um, They're pretty simple. Usually most building automation systems are not tied into the status of a water source heat pump, or you have a system that is standalone heat pumps with a like controlled tower. Um, Usually, I'd say what most of them are manual reset if they trip out, right? Yeah, especially if it's like a high pressure. Yeah. Uh, I think the low pressures. Uh, yeah. Reset. Yeah. Lows yeah, won't reset, like but the high pressure pressures pressure. usually have a, yeah. So that being said, you have to maintain condenser water flow through the condensers or the unit will trip out on high head pressure. Most systems that we see are manual reset on the high pressure. So you would actually have to either turn the unit off to cycle it or actually do a true push button cycle on the safety itself. Um, So you always need to be concerned about condenser water flow while the unit is active. So what we run into a lot of times is buildings that will, where the unit comes on after hours, but the condenser water system is not enabled and you'll trip a unit out and then the building engineer comes in the next morning and has all these units off and doesn't know why it would more than likely be because your condenser water system either failed or was not set to run. Um, If a system is in a, if the units are in the building automation system, we would monitor each unit. And if the temperatures start to get high, we would call for the condenser loop to start just to circulate water. And then our tower would stage up based on our set point. So if the water temperature starts to rise, 
we would start putting water over the, the heat exchanger and then start ramping fans up based on that set point. Um, other than that, they're pretty standard, just like a normal split or package unit. Um, what you got? It, it so your question is in an unoccupied state would we raise the condenser water loop set point right right so right that's if they yeah that's if they run when the system is off so like but to, to speak to that we can we, we typically don't um, because the system goes unoccupied so the loop stagnates um, so usually when when we write a program the tower is dormant unless it has flow right so we're not going to stage up fans unless the pumps are running so there's no point to raise the set point um no 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 not not at all it's i like talking points so keep them coming um okay mm-hmm One of them wasn't working, but for some reason with that one not working, it was making the other three not not communicate back to the board in the unit. So it was set up kind of like a like a zone damper setup? Yes, but it was on the that meta Metasys? That blue one. You know what I'm talking about? The old school. Like the the, the JCI kind of yes. square, like That's six by two looking yes. thing. So it was going into the controller on your DC voltage. Mm -hmm. And you had 24 volts AC on the other side of it, which was lighting everything up, sending a signal. But for some reason, that one being bad, it wasn't communicating with the other four. That's now, after I changed it out, it worked like a jam. Yeah. I just, I didn't understand why it was taking out the other three. Yeah, I'd have to see the wiring to really tell you okay, that that's that's, that's, that's a weird fun. scenario. I don't. Yeah. I got lucky by finding yeah. that those ran back to that. Yeah, I don't. I don't honestly know why you would do that. That doesn't yeah, make see, a whole lot of sense. first before they go back that way. Yeah. That's why I was like, maybe my problem. Well, I mean, I, I see the duck heater because if it was an aftermarket duck heater installed yes. and then they use one of those pen, con so those are, that's, those are made by pen. Yeah. JCI rebrands them, a couple other yeah, companies. And, they came off and then of that, that would control the heater, like the heat right. kit itself. So it would have its own set point on the pin thing with the space temp sensor in the space. Okay. The, the, Water source heat pump is controlling the cooling side of things, and then the pin is controlling the heating side of things. Right. Okay. So now, now what they may have been doing was using those valves to reduce airflow into the space. If so, like the the water source heat pump would constantly cool. Well, if this space got cold, it would shut that off. Right. But I mean, that, right. Yes. That, that's a way of because typically a. Uh, We'll get into this later because I'm going to talk about multi-zones. Okay. Um, but typically, you would not want to do that. That was somebody's right. fix. Be right. right, yeah. Each that You should not try and control multiple zones based on one, one unit, okay. one that's, sensor, that's right? Cool. Like, if you're going to do that, you're going to have problems because you don't get the independent control of each space, right? Okay. So, like, you're kind of what they were doing – Honestly, in that situation, I would have left the dampers out and just done the heaters with the pins. Okay. And then you still supply cooling all the time, but then you reheat it to warm the space back up right. because you can't, you want to maintain airflow. Right. If you start oh. closing all those valves, you're going to starve that cool for air and you're going to, it's going to go off on low pressure. Right. So it's, it it's not the sense. best way, but they probably didn't have a better solution other than that changing out equipment. The industry standard is how no. it's supposed to be. No, standard. no, that's, so my, that's definitely weird. Most of the ones I run into are usually only affect one zone. Yeah. And that's why I was curious. I didn't know if there was some new way that they were. No, that was somebody trying to alleviate some issues where, like, they probably had one customer. So, like, the customer budget, they were like, as yeah. soon as one place goes down, we know that all four are going to be. Yeah. yeah. So well, well, yeah, well, I mean, but that's, that's a, 
that wouldn't be a problem if you'd wired that up differently though. Right. They they were probably sharing voltage or going through each other, like yeah. using one to feed the other one and one failed so it didn't send voltage yeah. to the next one type deal. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they, they probably wired them all in series. And when one of them failed, the voltage didn't go through it to the next one. That's kind of right. And, and didn't know where yeah, the other were at. right. Yeah, that's, it's an overcomplicated that's way. Yeah. That's what I said. I back to the controller. Everything lay at the controller, but I was like, wow, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a weird one, man. That's yeah, that was that's a bad engineering job. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure. I mean, I figured yeah. it out, but I was like, well, I'm gonna ask about that. Yeah. Okay. Now you you were. It, it's more than likely what I said about they were ran in series with power yes. or something to that, okay. and once you lost one, you lost everything after it. That's kind of what I thought. Or it overloaded the transformer and it wasn't putting out high enough voltage to get to the rest. It, it, right. Without looking at it, it's hard to say, but it's probably something along those lines. Okay. So, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, that I mean, uh, so yeah, the, the key with the water source heat pumps on our side is is making sure you have flow established before you would call for a condenser. I mean, a compressor, because if not, you'll go out on high head. You can run them for a short amount of time, but a lot of them will trip. Um, on building automation systems, sometimes they have ISO valves, sometimes they don't. Um, it just really depends. Most small water source heat pumps, you're not going to have an ISO valve. Um, but then again, you get some bigger ones, and they do. But we'll touch on SCUDs in a little bit. Um, I wouldn't. I would. I wouldn't know. I would say return side, but that's just. That's typical of most valves. Most valves you're going to put on the return side. That way you don't starve an evaporator or not an evaporator, but starve a coil. If it's in front of the coil, it can technically pull out and create dead space in the coil and you may get a pocket or something in there. But if it's always got water in the coil, that can't happen. So <laughs> that's funny that you say that because I actually ran into that before because they were putting all those water valves in all the, the lead certified buildings. Mm -hmm. They were throwing them all on the inlet side of them. Yeah. And several of them failed, and you'd never get cooling out of it because it, the end switch had to make before the compressor turned on. Yeah. And it ran into air pockets because of that, because the suction side, you know, it's just it pulled it dry. Yeah. Yep. It can happen, especially if you have leaks in other places that are allowing air in. You can build a pocket in the coil. As, as long as the system's sealed, it shouldn't happen. But if you have a leak somewhere and you have air in your system, that, that can definitely happen. So just because, you know, it's going to stack where it can. So um, next we'll talk about single zone chill water air handlers. Really basic, constant volume fans. Your valve is going to open and close to maintain temperature. Um, really not a whole lot to explain there. Most valves are modulating or on off. Um, Real simple to diagnose. Mostly, is that what you're talking about? Are mostly all DC voltage running from the controller? So there's two ways to control valves. Well, actually, there's there's a lot more than two. I'll take that back. So <laughs> we can we can have on off or modulating. Okay. So on off would be it's either open or closed. So those can either be power to open, spring return closed, or they can be power to open, power to close. Um, the power to open, power to close can also be what we call floating. So I can modulate that valve based on sending power to it for a certain amount of time. So like, I'm gonna use round numbers because these are not accurate, but let's say in an actuator, it takes a hundred seconds to open. I would send it voltage for 50 seconds to go to 50%, 25 seconds to go to 25%. And then you, the controller knows the math internally for how long it needs to, it knows it because we program it but it knows how long it has to drive voltage to do that. So like I did a scud the other day, the guide vane, the inlet guide vane on the fan is a floating Bolimo actuator. So it's, it's, you send it voltage for X amount of time to open it to X position and then it stops and, then it, stops. and it just sits there with no voltage on it whatsoever okay. until you want it to go one way or the other again. And then you send voltage again. So, um, 
there are, like I said, two ways either on off or modulating. But when you get to modulating, you have three basic types. Uh, we won't touch on pulse width because we don't really do that in our industry, but we have four to 20 milliamp signal. So that would be a constant 24 volt at the con valve actuator, but the current modulates to position the valve. Um, those are typically a two wire setup. Sometimes they can be three, just depends on the brand. The other way would be a zero to 10 signal, which would have a constant 20 volt feed to the actuator. And then either a zero to 10, zero to five, two to 10, whatever scaling it needs to be, DC voltage for a signal for position. And then there's the floating, which is what I was talking about, where you send it voltage for a certain amount of time, determines position. Um, most VAVs and fan power boxes, your damper for cooling, your supply damper is a floating actuator. They're the cheaper, more like most small actuators are going to be floating. A lot of them. A lot, there are bigger ones that are, but you don't get as good a control. Usually you have to put like an in switch or a positioner on it or something like that to get a true feedback to know where it's at or else it's all just guesswork. So like uh, we used to have a real big problem with some trained PTAC units that had these cartridge valves that were floating. Over time, they would start to lose strength and they would go from being 120 seconds full open to full close normally, or sorry, 120 seconds to full open and then 120 seconds back to close. They would end up being like 230 after like five years. So that time would just steady, and the valves would get out of sync. So you would say send it to 50%, but it'd only make it to 25. Well, the valve's gonna the, the controller would stop driving after that set time period. So your valve never opens up all the way. It would, yeah, because you have no feedback, you have no position of the valve. Whereas like a uh, a Belimo SR actuator, so whatever part number first is going to describe your torque and voltage, and then like a dash SR or a dash MFT or dash three will determine what the signal is for that actuator. So like a dash SR or an MFT, you're sending them a zero to 10 or a two to 10 signal. And it internally knows, hey, if I'm getting five volts, I want to be at 50%. Yeah. And it's going to go to 50%. You don't have to worry about that timing. You just say 50%, 100%, 75% with a voltage signal. We don't do a whole lot of milliamp stuff. Um, but process control and industrial is full of 24 volt milliamp stuff and milliamp can be AC or DC. It just depends on the equipment. Um, the, there, yes. Well, so that, that was the, a lot of older VFDs would be milliamp. The new stuff typically standards DC voltage. Yeah. 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 You can switch them and, and you can on a lot of the older ones. Um, you just have to know where to go. And some of them are like, like an ABB is a dip switch and a setting in the controller, at least on the 550s. I don't know about the 580s. So it's only the dip switch now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I, I've only done two eight. I've only done two 580s. So I don't. So, so that's a resistor will convert four to 20 to the DC voltage. Yep, so you can use a 500 ohm quarter watt resistor to convert to 4 to 20 to 2 to 10. So you can't convert it the other way. You can't put a resistor on 2 to 10 to make it 4 to 20, but you can convert 4 to 20 to 2 to 10 with a resistor. You can also use a, uh, what is it? It's, I forget, I'm, I'm going to be wrong on their ohms, but you can also convert it to a 0 to 5. You can do other with different ohm ratings. I don't remember what they are. I have a chart and a bunch of extra. I'll just start one way this resistor. Yeah. So, but yeah, there's, there's a bunch of different ways to do that, but you're typically, there are three ways to control a valve actuator. Like I said, it would either be on off modulating with like a zero to 10, or it's going to be floating with a voltage to open voltage to close type deal. Didn't they so. call those three? For some term, because I took the Belimo, like their online school mm -hmm. yeah. and they talked about, you know, the floating, you yeah. know, your conventional just on off. Yeah, I don't. Then, I don't remember what Belima calls it. They so they have a term. Three, three way or yeah. three position or something. Well, like that. it wouldn't be three position. It's the dash threes on Belimo. Their part numbers are like if you have a an AMB dash three, 
it, that denotes the the torque, the the frame size, and the the voltage. And then dash three would mean the three wire for power open, common, power closed. So, but it just depends. Different brands are different terminologies for part numbers. So, but maybe one day we'll do another class on valves where Casey doesn't just tear everything apart. <laughs> <laughs> you remember that? I remember that. Just like, <laughs> he was like, that was brand new. You're like, no, oh. we weren't supposed to take that one all the way apart. No, we keep giving me stuff and then a hammer. Yeah. Oh, uh, all right. So that, you know, like I said, single zone chill water stuff is really simple. Your valve is what's going to modulate or open close. Like uh, we just did a retrofit on a bunch of fan coil units in a hotel. They're just two position. They're either open or close. So it, it's working just like a DX stage. We have no modulation. It's a little spring return cartridge valve. You send it 24 volts. It holds it open. You take 24 volts off, spring return closed. There's no modulation, no nothing. It's either cooling or it's not. So, um, but when you have a modulating one, it will typically, your signal will increase and the valve will open, but it also depends on how the valve is, the actuator set up. You can, on Belimos, there's a switch to change rotation. Reverse yeah, right. yep. You can change them to where zero can be full open, 10 can be full closed. So you just gotta. I actually had that problem with my yeah. call I just left. Oh, really? It wasn't working though. Yeah. 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 Glad yeah. On that, that little switch that's on that always switch is separate from the voltages inside of that Belimo telling you what to do, correct? Yes and no. So anytime you're gonna mess with that switch, you want to turn that the actuator off, power it down, flip the switch, power it back up. Okay, don't do it while it has power no. to it. it. It'll work most of the time. But sometimes you'll get them and they, they don't do it. And if you power them off, then it'll do it. And you change it back and you didn't realize it, like, and you'll just, you'll start shaping, like, which way was I? Like, I did not know that. So it's always, it's always better to power it down first. Okay. Well, let me run across and get your opinion on this. So, you know, everything was working fine before with this belief. It's just a, th it's a three-way valve has the, has the bypa yeah. bypass for the air, yeah. for the fan coil, you know? Is it mixing or diverting? Uh, it's d diverting. Okay. Yeah. It's just diverting. So, I mean, it, it, everything was set up properly. So all the rest of the air handlers, because I went around to the, to the other three-way valves and looked at them as, a, as my reference, you know. He had 100% commands on all of them. And they were, you, I had the flow through the coils. Well, this particular one, you know, the reverse acting, direct acting, it wasn't doing anything. So I'm like, oh, okay. He had 100% command, but it wasn't doing anything. Once he went to zero... It was like somebody had switched the controls, yeah. you know, but and, nobody had touched it. And, it. and it could have been that just that part of that actuator has failed. So I, I've, we actually had a job I just found a while weird. back that had some Johnson valve actuators that did that. We couldn't figure out what was going on. And to save the customer from replacing the valve, I went in the control program and flipped the signal. And then once they got some capital budget available, they, they went through it. They changed all their air handler valves. I mean, I asked him that too. I'm like, hey, dude, has somebody been messing with the controls? I'm like, yeah. because the only time I can get it to actually even function is when you go to zero, but everything else, it does it on 100%. Yeah. And he said, no, nobody's touched it. Yeah. And it, it, like, a, it could just be a bad actuator. It, it, Which I mean, is why it, I'm curious it's, if the reverse yeah. acting and acting is on like a separate, a separate no, it's, board it's, or something it's a, in there that's telling it to be it what would, it's doing. I don't know for sure, but I would assume it's all part of one board. That's just like a little potentiometer in right. there, or not a potentiometer, but like a little switch that mm -hmm. you're just turning that's on the whole baseboard of the controller. Right. I don't know for sure without tearing it apart because I'm right. I build actuators, but it more than likely that that part has either failed or something else has failed, causing that not to function properly. Like you may have a bad diode or something that's causing that not to work the way it should. So. The same just, determination that Jason. Yep. Well, the other option. Replacing so the other option on a damper actuator, you can take it off and flip it over mm -hmm. and put it back on. And that will reverse the rotation. I've, I've done I've done those yep. on, with your, you yeah. know, your louvers and yeah. you know, your So if, if you don't have a switch, you can always flip them over. 
Or if your switch has gone bad, you could flip it over. Now, if it's a, a direct coupled actuator, you don't have that option. But if it's a like a jack shaft, mm -hmm. like a uh, rack and pinion setup mm -hmm. with like a shaft sticking out and the, the damper goes over the shaft, you could flip it 180 degrees and that would reverse your rotation. So it could have been that somebody took it off and flipped it over. And you said it was loose. What's that? That actuator. Yeah, the... Uh... Was it turned as you, as you, as you, as well, you, you were talking about the, the, you, you the said the linkage was loose, not the actual actuator on the shaft. No, the, no, the, the okay, actuator actual. itself was, was solid. It was, yeah, uh, it was, as yeah. you call it, like the mushroom. That yeah, the little, down yeah, the little thing that goes over the way. shaft and grabs. Yeah, all. I mean, yeah. it had all kinds of slop in it. Yeah, and there's no telling. Maybe somebody was pulling on it with a wrench, or mm -hmm. I've seen people pull stems up Maybe and put vices on them. Maybe as I was, because I barely fit up. In between a half tile. We've, we've had some small guys that work here before. <laughs> Standing by my decision that it's bad. Yeah. I would, I, and Me too. More than not, I would Stand change it. it. It's, it's probably due to be changed. All right. So that's enough for single zone stuff. Um, <laughs> let's go to like a package RTU or a built-up DX unit with VABs. So along the lines of what you were talking about with your giant split. So still the same principle on staging. Um the difference is, since it's VAVs, you're more than likely maintaining discharge temperature. Some older systems maintain return temperature. It just, you would have to know how it was programmed to determine. Um, or if you looked at it and you don't have a discharge sensor, you only have a return, that would help you determine. Um, but basic algorithms, closer you get to set point, you would stage down. Farther away you get from set point, you would stage up. Um, so like, say you have a four stage unit, you're running like a 55 degree discharge, your set point's 55, depending on how the algorithm's written and set up, if you start to get above 55, you would stage up below 55, you would stage down. Now there's going to be a dead band or a prop band in there. That's going to determine how quickly things stage up or down. And then you also determine through the PID as to how far away from set point, how fast it reacts. So you get proportional and an integral. An integral is the time and a proportion is like the distance from set point. Nobody ever uses so, the derivative. Nope. <laughs> no, nine times out of 10, we don't use derivative. Derivative just determines on like startup, how quickly something reacts. I was always under the assumption that was more like it was looking down the road. Yeah, kind of thing. yeah. It's, it's like the predictive side of things. Mm -hmm. So like if when equipment first starts up and then if it's been away from it for a long time, derivative can play into it but we, we hardly ever use derivative. It's just not necessary in, in this type of control, like in process control and things like that, it's important. But in what we're doing, it's it's comfort control. It's not really necessary. Um, I wanna say maybe once every 10 times we do it, we even tweak derivative, but it's, it's usually tweaking derivative. We don't really like throw in big numbers or throw it in, on a large scale, it's like, all right, let's do like a little, little sprinkle of derivative here and a little sprinkle, you know, yeah, it's, you never hardly see a yeah, full pit. Right, right, yeah. So it's usually just the P and the I, the proportional and the integral. But that being said, like I said, depending on how the pit is configured, will determine how quickly you ramp up and how quickly you ramp down based on that staging. Now, because it's a staged unit, there a lot of times will be interstage delays on time for like minimum run timers and things like that that have to be taken into account. And what sucks in a, in a control system is it's not a solid defined number. So it may even be something that you can't go look at on like a display or something. You would have to actually get into the controller's algorithm to find that stuff out. A lot of times, every time we do it, we map that stuff out into the, the system, but even the engineer may not be able to see it. You may have to be able to like get in the background of things to see those points. Um, if y'all ever get to, see, yeah, to get to that's what I was about. If y'all ever, if y'all ever need that, just phone call. Yeah. We can get you in. Yep. But that being said, like Holden and I did a chiller, and and due to how it was set up, it has a display on it. From that display, we can get to those things. The customer can't. They're locked out from from accessing that stuff because we don't typically you know, we're not going to have a customer stage. going in and tweaking the interstage delays and stuff like that. Right. That's something once we set them, we're going to want them left alone right. for most of the time. So if I do give them to a customer or do put them in a graphic, they're going to be read only. They're not going to be adjustable. 
Um, and everyone's going to be different unless it's we're doing the same with a couple types of equipment. You know, if we're doing the same air handler 10 times, they're probably all going to be set up the same for their interstate delays. Right. But from building to building, equipment to equipment, it's, it's totally dependent on the system and then the tuning of it. So, like, I did a scud last week, and there, it's a three-minute delay on startup for each stage and then a five-minute minimum runtime on each stage unless there's a safety event, you know, like, and it'll shut down immediately. But for normal staging, we let it run for X amount of time because you don't get full capacity right when the compressor kicks on. So you don't right. want to immediately bump on the next one. You want to let it run and level out and see what you're going to get before you bring on the next one. And then if you're doing return temp control versus discharge, that's a much broader loop. It's going to be a lot slower acting because you're affecting the whole space instead of just the air coming out of the coil, right? A discharge loop is going to be much faster reacting than a return loop would be because you have a, a lot bigger process environment to control. You're talking about circulating air and pulling it back through, whereas just controlling right off the coil. A lot less variables. Yeah, a lot less variables. So actually a lot more variables, sorry, in a, in a return because you've got all the space to circle through and heat loads and things like that. Whereas, whereas off the coil, you're just controlling on that one variable. So, mm -hmm. um, so like, uh, well, you use that also, right? Like you can bring in uh, fresh air, outdoor air to help temper the, uh, <laughs> we're in Austin, bro. Yeah, we don't get economizers way, here. Way no. So, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, technically, it's, it's not 100 degrees all year. The only time you're going to see the economizer run here is in December. So. Yeah, technically, yes, we can we can run economizers and <laughs> and, yeah. and a lot a lot of buildings. So like the let's I'll use this I'll use the scud that I was working on the other day. So it monitors return air temp, and based on return air temp, we enable our cooling pit. Okay, so if return air temp is within a certain value, we would enable the cooling pit. So, like, if return air temp is 60 to 95, it's enabled. If it's outside of that, so, like, if it's below 60, I don't even let the unit cool because we can be in a free cooling event because it has this giant VAV box. It's like a 16-inch VAV box supplying, like, 3,000 CFM of outside air. So, if you've got 3,000 CFM of outside air in a unit that only does 20,000 CFM and that outside air is 45 degrees... I can get some free cooling out of it. It may not make 45 degree discharge, but it may make 60 in the winter, which is, good which is plenty enough in the winter because you're not cooling, you're heating. Although right. it's Texas, so you may be heating. <laughs> I mean, maybe cooling. Maybe. So it, it just depends. Different systems are different ways. Um, but like if we talk about like a built up DX, like a big, like a 90 or 120 ton split, like up on a roof that's doing like a flak fan system. And we have like true outside air dampers and true return dampers and stuff like that. We can get some true free cooling because then you're talking about a lot more CFM than like a scud with a VAV box, like a little 16 inch damper. So like in that case, like we have a building up downtown that has two flat fan units, one an east and a west. And they're what are they? 90 ton, 80 ton? Uh, they're they're 80s, they're right? They're 100 tons now. They used to be 80s. Yeah, they were 80s. Yeah. Yep. So mm -hmm. there's two air handlers, but each air handler is a flak air handler. So it's a big, giant vein axial fan, but they can do 100% outside air. So we can completely shut the return. We have a uh, an exhaust damper, which will let the the return side pressure out of the building as we pull in 100% outside air. So if it's 60 degrees outside and we meet enthalpy, so if the temperature and the humidity are within range and we meet our enthalpy set point, then we can pull in 100% outside air and get total free cooling. Mm -hmm. It's super rare. It's usually <laughs> first thing in the morning, mm -hmm. you know, but it's possible, you know, and, and so that algorithm is in the building. But Do you have a lot of face and bypass out there? I'll, I'll get to that. It's funny that you say face bypass instead of multi-zone though. <laughs> so, well, that's coming. That's two more down. Um, so then we'll, we'll talk about SCUDs next. Um, Self-contained air handlers with VAVs. Basically a giant water source heat pump. You know, it's got a condenser loop flowing through it. 
most scuds, unless someone's taken them off, will have an ISO valve on it. So the when the unit first enables, it'll open up the water valve to allow water to flow through the condenser coil. Seen a lot of them lately that have been removed. Don't yeah, recommend it. Flow meter yeah. Right yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why a flow meter? I don't. It's a closed loop system. I don't. Who puts a flow? I. I think I know what building you're talking about. Yeah, Had a flow yeah. meter on a condenser loop. Yep. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Now <laughs> I've. I've seen BTU meters, so right. flow and temperature, right. to calculate load to bill a customer back for after hours usage. Right. That I've seen. But at that point, but like the they don't. Flow switcher, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, a paddle flow switch makes sense because you want to establish flow on the coil. Flow. Yeah, you want to establish flow at the unit. And a lot of them will have that or they have an in switch on the damper or something along those lines. Um, sorry, not damper, on the actuator. Um, the ones I did the other day do not have an in switch. They are just once, I think, 120 seconds have passed of calling for it. Oh, yeah. It'll, And then they'll shut off on high pressure if, if there's no water flow. Um, but like I said, basically a giant water source heat pump. You open a valve, water starts flowing through the condenser. It does have an entering and leaving condenser water temperature sensor that we can monitor. Um, so I guess I could establish some kind of sequence to monitor that flow and see if it, the temperature changes in that and establish flow, but it's, it's not important. Um, depending on how the unit is designed, it's DX. You stage up and down based on your temperature, whether it's maintaining a lot of them. So like McQuay's, we can pick a reference for temperature, whether it's return, space, right. supply, that they have different modes you can select in their factory controls. Um, and when we retrofit stuff and pull out factory controls on like old units, we'll do the same thing. We can go in and I'll, I'll set up a variable and I can pick which supplies, which sensor we want, supply or return. And then based on that, it will also change the control algorithm to be to react differently. You know, a, a return pit is going to be slower than a supply pit. So it'll do that internally on pretty much every one we've done in the last couple of years. That there may be some older ones out there. We didn't put that functionality in because we they wanted supplier temp only or something like that. Um, but at least the last handful we've done, we've put in a, a setting to change from return to supply if you want to. Um, static pressure, same thing. The static pressure control and stuff can either be, there's three ways to control static pressure in a unit for a variable volume system. Uh, really old systems have what they call a bypass damper and you will just literally open up the side of the supply and circulate it back into the return to maintain pressure in your supply duct. Um, you have, uh, What am I, why am I drawing a blank? I literally just said it a minute ago. Um, the vein dampers, what are they? Just like the, when you have a damper on a motor, the motor, yeah, inlet guide vein, there we go. So you can do inlet guide vein, which is a constant speed motor. It's just on or off. And then you limit the amount of airflow that can come into the fan by a, a, a vein. Like, like those it's, old train rooftops, right? right? Yep. Never yeah, it's 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 got what looks like an iris, you know, like an iris on like a or a lens on a camera that like spins and opens and closes type deal. But it's usually just a bunch of flaps. And what they'll do is open and close, and that limits how much air can go through the fan. So That's you starve the, the fan for air to lower pressure. You allow more air to increase pressure. Um, and then the third type would be a modulating fan with a VFD, where you speed up and slow down the fan. Um, those are going to be pretty typical, nothing real special, just a direct acting as pressure rises, we would, sorry, reverse acting as, as pressure drops, we increase our output as pressure increases, we decrease our output. Um, Depending on what the static sensors. Right. Yeah. Right. So if the static pressure gets close to set point, you would start to drop the fan back down. Right. If it gets away from set point below set point, you would increase your speed. Um, 
Do what? I said that we were just saying they're almost every unit's like that now. Yeah, yeah. Most stuff nowadays is, unless it's just an older piece of equipment, it's going to have a VFD on it. Yeah. The energy savings that comes from VFDs is well worth the, the cost. Turn fans are on drives. Yep. Yeah. I mean, everything's on the drive. Think about it from the startup sequence. Yeah. You're, you're not actually doing an XL start on a 60 horse motor yep. you're, yeah, you're slowly in, ramping you're, it your inrush currents yeah, less you're you're you're, you're you like wearing you're wearing <laughs> you're wearing tear on belts i mean all kinds of like stuff to see, you see that amp goes at a 300 yeah yeah i mean you save tons of money going to drives or a bare minimum a soft start you know yeah. i mean if, if you've got like a texas multi-zone or a face bypass unit that is constant volume i mean just putting a soft start on it can save you a ton of money i mean there's carrier on their little simple Rooftop yeah. units mm -hmm. with the drives. They, yeah. It's just a soft starter with a two-speed motor, yep. 40 and 60 hertz. But yeah, yeah. It's the same concept. Yeah, I mean, little five-ton rooftops have them nowadays. I mean, it's crazy. They're going to all those ECM motors. That way they don't freaking... Sorry, you could have finished your thought. Oh. Uh, we did have a question. Uh, so <clears throat> if you have a return fan, do you prefer to control based off of supply fan tracking or pressure? So return fans are usually off of building pressure. That's, that's all we usually base them on. So it just depends. I've rarely done them off of supply. Uh, we do have one building that tracks with supply, but it's a multi-zone. So it's a little different. It's not doing static pressure control per se. They they put drives on a big multi-zone and it, I don't even want to talk about it. Um, should never put a drive on a multi-zone. I'm gonna say it. Soft start, yes. Drive doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Not at all. Well, unless you, yeah, unless you want to yeah, soft start. Yeah, if you're using it, but then just buy a soft start. They're cheaper, simpler. Star Delta starter. Huh? Star Delta starter. Yeah. Uh huh. Yep. Yeah. We're not gonna go into those. I hate those things. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, uh, yeah, return fans are typically off of building okay. pressure. Um, it, it just, I don't really know of any other building except for this one that I'm thinking of that has them following a supply fan. I guess you could, I don't know why you would even track with it though. A lot of return fans just run 100%. They don't even do anything. Well, I think it also depends on how the... It depends on what type of system. If you're talking about a true, like, dedicated outside air, then... Well, dedicated outside air is not going to have a return fan. Oh, yeah, they do. Yeah, some of them do. Well, so I guess that's... Well, that would be one clarifier. Are we talking a true return fan for an air handler, or are we talking a relief? Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Be, yes, a relief fan is... To me, that's yeah. different. So a relief fan is definitely going to be... That is building pressure. Or a, a return damper could be that way as well. Uh, but a return fan on an air handler, like I said, most of the time they're constant volume. They're just circulating air. But when they're not, they're they're still static pressure control on the building pressure side. Is that you agree? Disagree? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, I mean, I'm not the one with the questions. <laughs> uh, so next, we can talk about a chill water air handler with VAVs. Um, same basic thing. Chill water control is just like a, a single zone, except you're maintaining discharge temperature nine times out of 10. I uh, don't know many people that maintain return with a chill water air handler, but it, it is possible. You could do it. We we'll just don't do it in Texas. Um, then your static pressure is going to control to maintain, or sorry, your VFD would ramp or your bypass damper would open or your inlet guide vanes would modulate to maintain static pressure. Um, the next thing, what Jason mentioned, was a multi-zone. Um, so there's there's two kinds of multi-zones that, that we have in Texas. They're typically face bypass. They actually nicknamed them Texas multi-zones for that reason, because um, we don't use the heating side of them. <laughs> uh, but you can have a hot deck, cold deck multi-zone, which has a valve for heating and a valve for cooling. Um, basically, you have two coils in a unit that are stacked on top of each other with a divider. So this would be your whole return face. And then actually here, let's draw it this way. 
So we'll do, so this is our return side. Then we have coils. And then the ductwork is actually split right here. And then it would come up. And there's a damper that sits right here between them. So you would have a hot, Nicole, can you see that on the camera? Okay. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> always, always. So uh, on a hot deck, cold deck, you have a cold coil and a hot coil. And what happens is in your zone, so these are always maintaining this temperature in here. You have a sensor typically right after the coil. Um, each valve will modulate independently to maintain their hot deck and cold deck. And then for your zones, you have a, a damper that can determine which way the air comes from. And your air is going to take the path of, least, path of least resistance. So as you close off the cold deck, the air is going to travel through the hot deck. As you close off the hot deck, air is going to travel through the cold deck. In Texas, we don't have cold. No, we have the cold. We don't have the hot dog. <laughs> so we call these face bypass. Yeah. So you either hit the face of the coil or you bypass it completely. So a the the reason when I said that don't put a VFD on a multi-zone is they're designed to be constant volume. So all of your dampers are set up and all of your zone registers are set up to be constant flow. Um, in Texas, what we do have would be each zone coming off of this would have a heat kit either with a hot water valve or an electric heater and typically they're way way smaller in load compared to the, the hot deck that would be on the, the the unit itself and you would have each one of these based on its own temperature sensor kind of like what you were talking about with that unit having all those pen controllers they basically built the multi-zone is right. what they were doing um but so then out of the air handler, you would have multiple trunk lines going to the space, each with its own heater and a sensor. And based on the controller, the controller would either open or close your face bypass damper or open and close your heater to maintain space down. Um, I've seen them like that, but I also saw them where, you know, you had the ductwork where they literally split it in half mm -hmm. and yeah. you had 90, 90 degree opposed so, uh, so that's called a dual duct system. So that, that's what we call those is dual duct. So in, in a dual duct system, you, you have a, a metering device, which is opposed dampers that one opens, one closes. Uh, Mr. Manuel's building has, has a bunch of those. <laughs> a whole bunch. Uh-huh. A whole bunch. They mm -hmm. suck. Mm -hmm. So does Bob. Huh? So does Bob. He's yeah. Got a bunch of them too. Yep. But yeah, so the, that's a, a dual duct VAV or a dual duct multi-zone can be the same way. Um, but most multi-zones we'll see are going to be of this nature where you have face bypass and then a, a heat kit or a heat uh, coil for each independent zone. So there's a lot of that out here. Well, less in Austin, but a ton of it in Houston, like a ton of it. And East Texas. Yeah. And East Texas. They but. do it a little bit different from where I came from. They were using the face and bypass. The bypass was connected to the outdoor. Okay. So for, for fresh air. I mean, because, you know, yeah. it's a lot cooler there. Yeah. So a lot of the times, you know, the chiller would go down to minimum or they were using they were using globe valves. So you can, because they were, it was all about discharge air. That was it. Yeah. That was the whole basis of everything. But a lot of the times, you know, the face would close and you would just bypass. You know, yes. Yeah. So and, and, air in there. And, and, and that's, we get that too, but a lot of times what you would have is a makeup air unit that's supplying air down a trunk line into each mechanical room. And then those are set usually with a damper to a certain value. Like, let's just say if you got a 20,000 CFM air handler and you want 10% outside air all the time, right? And then, so you can get some free cooling when that air is colder, kind of like I was saying with the Scud and the big VAV box, same type set up texas is different man we it's hot here it's awesome <laughs> so it. you know it, it's it's one of those things we don't most of the time in texas at least in the austin houston san antonio area we, we don't really 
economization is not priority. <laughs> It's 103 degrees outside, yeah. Oh, that's it? I thought it was supposed to be 106 today. Dang it, man. It got cold. Just wait till you start walking up to the rooms where we unplug the economizer. Uh-huh. Yeah, those are fun. What do you need it for? <laughs> I mean, the only other thing they were used for, too, was uh, the CO2. Yeah. When the CO2 alarms that's, went off. So were... that's, that is becoming prevalent, especially after COVID. We have a lot of buildings that never would have done CO2 control that now want it. So we're we're dealing with a lot of retroactive CO two stuff. Um, I've been seeing them on rooftop units a lot yeah. more with even those little the jades and the Belimos. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. The Honeywell jades are nice. Those Belimos are, are my favorite. Yes. Yeah, the Belimos are. I prefer. Play. I prefer the Belimos as well, but the jades aren't bad. No. I, I. They're all right. Um, but yeah. So actually, that's that's something we could touch on is CO two control, but. Two ways to control CO2 would be either return air CO2, where you're taking, you know, a, an average of the space based on the return, or in a lot of building automation systems, they'll have key sensors throughout the building in certain spots that are monitoring the floor CO2, and they can either average or load base those to determine what you do with outside air. Um, like, uh, like I was saying, that Scud with the VAV box, it does that. So it's got, it's doing return air CO2 because their return is technically mixed because the VAV is constantly pumping air into the room, which is pulling from the return. So it's got 3000 CFM of outside air plus the return mixing together, coming into the return inlet of the unit. That outside air will modulate close down to 1200 CFM if the CO2 is below 900 CFM, parts per million. So if it gets close or above 900 parts per million, it'll start to ratchet its outside air up to drop that concentration of CO2. So, and then it actually doesn't have any kind of economization algorithm at all. So when I was talking about that, it's actually a bad reference, but it's purely based on CO2. So it's got a 1200 CFM minimum, and a 3000 CFM max. And those are just, I don't remember what the numbers are exactly, but, and it modulates based on that CO2 demand of the building or the floor itself. So I've seen, you know, your mushroom fans that are on your bigger mushroom fans on drives. That yeah. They'll modulate it. You know, if you're getting up 2000 your limit, but you're around 1700, you'll just start spinning nice and yeah. slow and try yeah. to drop it down under a thousand. Yeah. Yeah. 900 is a, a typical ash rate set point for CO2. Anything below 900 is fine. Anything above 900, you want to start circulating air. So. I don't know if it's changed since COVID. They may have, a lot of buildings do air changes, not CO2. They want three cycles per hour, five, you know, it just depends. I think like hospitals are seven cycles per hour. Most commercial buildings are like three. Um, don't quote me on those. I'm not a hash rate standard guy or an engineer. Um, but yeah, they, they vary, but it depends. But CO2 control is a good way to reduce that load you get from outside air when you don't need it. Because if you've got a big outside air, let's just say damper, and you have, like if it's a 20,000 CFM unit and you're bringing it, can bring in 10,000 CFM of outside air all the time, that's a lot of extra load. It's 100 degrees outside that you don't need if your CO2 is not necessary. So if you're below your CO2 threshold, you would shut that damper down reduce the load, increase the efficiency of your equipment. So, but a lot of stuff we have in Austin is uh, not passive outside air. It is active outside air. So it's got like a makeup air machine with cooling on it and it's supplying 70 degree air all the time type Just deal. Tempering. Yeah, tempering it. It doesn't need to be cold, but you bring in like, you know, 70, 75, that way it's meeting return temp. They call, that, they call that like a neutral or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. neutral. neutral. Yep. neutral air. Yeah. So you can either have passive or active outside air, which passive would be it's just drawing it in. There's no cooling, no heating, no nothing. Then you can have active outside air, which would be heated and cooled to temper to space type deal. So, but typically most outside air is going to be controlled to a neutral set point. So, but yeah, because you don't want to, you don't want to bring in 45 degree air when you're trying to heat everything up and you don't want to bring in hundred degree air when you're trying to cool everything down. So do, do they use a, a lot of the makeup airs out here to supply for the water source heat pumps? Cause I've seen that a lot where, where I moved here from the makeup airs. That's a lot of them. They were strictly for just keeping 
the temperature for the for the water source heat pump. That was strictly all they did. They just, just pumped it in somewhere. above the grid to keep it, you know, reasonable when it's 10 degrees outside, you know. And they dumped it into the supply side? No, they just dumped it above the grid. Yeah, the so they, they, they just brought oh, it into the return plant. have open ducts, like, in yeah. various little spots, right. and it's 10 degrees outside, so you're kicking on the burners, but you're only maintaining a 70-degree discharge yeah. air, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's there. I don't know of many systems that just dump it into the return. But like I said, like with this scud I was working on, it has a VAV box, right? And and it's doing that as well. That VAV box is, it has a, it's an ERV. So mm -hmm. it's using exhaust air to temper the air coming in for some desiccant wheels yeah, and all yeah. that. Yeah. For like free cooling, basically energy conservation. That way you're not just dumping your cold air out and bringing in hot air. You're recovering some of the energy through the wheel but that is pumping in through the thing and then being fed into the return of that unit right mm -hmm. so it's it is cooling to some extent but we don't have those 10 degree days and stuff like that here well, where you need to these, they were all they were pretty much all open airs yeah you know, they were all open air returns so you would just periodically see yeah just dunking we, there and it was bringing in 70 degree air so yeah. we get know. lots of systems where they are piped in with ductwork to the return of a unit okay. because they have outside air requirements, right? That's like if, especially new stuff, Any, anything new, like we did a retrofit a couple years ago on a building that had a ton of split systems. Every split system had like a six inch duct mm -hmm. that was literally right next to the return of it. And then some of them, even the newer ones, when we would replace them, they would actually duct it into the unit after the filter. Of the, re the return filter mm -hmm. so we just come in like to a little plenum you'd have your your face right here with your your filters and then this little six inch duck would just come into the return plenum so but same type thing you're talking about in theory it's just i like hearing yeah. different, different things you know, different and it's experiences. different engineers design stuff differently you know it's we have a couple of engineers in town that you can always tell which engineer did it by how the system's set up like you look at it and you go oh so and so designed this one. Oh, so and so designed this one it's they each have their preferences right like just like all of us we have You're preferences in the, in the way <laughs> we do stuff so <laughs> but, uh so that covers multi-zones that's your basic equipment we have in austin um we don't get like chilled beam or any weird stuff it, it's basic splits packages big variable volume air handlers we get a few flax every now and then uh, some of, a lot of the older buildings still have flax stuff um, most of the flax we deal with have been converted to variable volume with drives they're no longer using the vein axial side of things um, y'all y'all know about that stuff huh they've all been converted no. there's still a few out there there's only one <laughs> there's only one right now working on it that's the only one that still uses the veins I'll yeah I love those things. I, I, don't, I don't want to put it in my VFD. <laughs> They're so, so much easier to work so on. Yeah. As but soon as I lock it down, it's done. What's funny, though, it's is so the, the fan itself is technically less efficient once you lock it down. I, For air purposes, yeah. the, the curve of the fan changes, right? That's because you're, you're locking in a constant pitch. But Right, because you're locking it usually yeah. at five degrees less than what the max yeah. pitch is. Yeah, most the, of the, the fan curve itself becomes less efficient, but the system as a whole becomes more efficient. So, but whatever, I digress. That's not what we're here to talk about. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, the next thing, we're, we're going to touch on some typical chill water systems that we have in, in, in good old Austin. Um, Big drawings this time. Yeah, we're we're gonna, we're gonna go. We're we're gonna we're gonna go slightly larger drawings. And I actually, for those of y'all following online, Holden has some diagrams and some stuff that will be shared. Uh, let's see. What do we want to touch on first? How much time we got? Uh, you got forty-five minutes. Forty-five minutes. Okay. So, let's see. I guess let's talk about them first. And then we can touch on some sequences. Um, all right. There are four basic types of systems we have in Austin. Um, so we've got either, let's go.
There's a light bar and the lights right there. <laughs> All right. Is this low enough? You couldn't have said that before I finished the first word. Did I spell that right? Why does that look wrong? Second. Okay. Then we have well, I guess we should say Be technical here. Not all of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We got Jason over here who, who wants to who wants to reference New York for everything. We're not in Buffalo. Well, we'll we'll stick to liquid because I, I we actually well I guess the process loop is glycol, not. Yeah. Okay. Never mind. Um, all right, four basic types of systems we have are primary loop with either air-cooled or liquid-cooled machine, and then a primary and secondary loop system with an air-cooled or liquid-cooled machine. Um, we will start with, let's just stick with primary for now. Um, primary loop. So I won't get into the intricacies of air-cooled versus water-cooled yet, um, but we will start with a typical primary loop system, which, which page was that? I thought I had a primary loop. Yeah, just this one, the variable, yeah, page eight, right? The diagram looks weird for some reason now. Yeah, we had a primary. Uh, it's, it's a variable primary, but that's irrelevant. Okay, yeah, so it's page eight then. Yeah. That one. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just a variable. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah, it's just a variable flow. Okay, you can pull that one up? Yep. Okay. So, primary loop system would be, I'll try and draw it as close to this as we can. Um, and go. This is a chiller. You want to do one chiller first? Okay. Well, I'll just draw it what the diagram is then. And we'll do. We'll do two, one. We'll come out. Valve. Come out. Valve. Got this one coming together. And we can come across. Yeah. 
I pass it on. Can you see that down there? Does that show up? Okay. All right. Okay. So the first type we'll touch on is just a typical primary loop system. Um, went ahead and drew it with two chillers and two pumps just so we can get an understanding of the system. Um, okay. Sorry, just trying to get my bearings. So in a typical system, we have a load. Your chillers will output your cold water, comes down, hits the load, circulates back. It's a little. Just so we see the flow here. Okay. So have a load, load draws temperature out of the loop, pumps pull it back in and push it through the chillers, circulates back through the system. Uh, in the diagram provided in the literature, um, we actually have a variable primary flow system. Um, so what that does is you have pumps which are headed together and we do most systems that have dual pumps only run one pump or the other. So let's just say pump one, pump two. So pump one would be our lead pump. Pump one is going to start, push water through chiller one. Chiller one valve would open, allowing flow through the barrel, circulates through the system, goes to our load. After our, at, well, I should have drawn two of them. Here, let's do an additional load. Dang it, I can't write upside down. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, I'm trying to be precise here, Holden. In the system, we would have a differential pressure sensor. It is monitoring, is that too low? No, okay. So this would monitor our differential pressure at the top of the loop. Based on this differential pressure and a set point in the system, the pump would modulate to maintain that pressure. Um, typical buildings are around 13, 15, 18, but your sequence of operation would define that. Um, that number is come up with by what the coils need to maintain in order to be the most efficient. Um, pump modulates to maintain that. If the pump reaches, reaches its minimum flow value for the chillers where, what, with what they need to be taken into consideration for is you have to maintain a certain amount of flow through the evaporator. So you would have a minimum set in this VFD that way, no matter what, we never drop below that minimum, or it can be programmed in the system, but I prefer to put it in the VFD. That way, even if the system were to call for less flow, it just cannot do it. Um, what is it? It's six GPM per ton? Three, the standard? Yeah, four or something like that. I don't remember what it is, but the, basically there's, there's a formula for how many gallons per minute per ton of cooling that, a condent, that an evaporator needs to maintain. So we would set a minimum in our VFD. That way you're always pushing a certain amount of flow through your chiller, no matter what. And then outside of that range, we can ramp it up or down to maintain this differential. So once that has been reached, if we get to the minimum here, we have a bypass valve that can open and allow flow to circulate through the system, but not hit the coils to keep water circulating at the proper speed or flow rate. Um, pretty basic. A lot of air-cooled systems are this way. Um, most of the chill, the sorry, liquid cool systems we deal with are this way. 
Um, we do have a few of the next type we'll talk about. The only difference technically in an air-cooled versus a liquid-cooled would be your condenser side effects. An air-cooled has, obviously, an air-cooled condenser. So you've got... Let me think about how to be Picasso real quick and draw this out. Um, let's just what? go... Do what? With a fan on top. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I mean, you got a, a fan, coil, <laughs> and then we've got... Is that a quarter ton? Huh? Is that a quarter ton coil? Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> is, is that like a mini split? <laughs> a little better? There, we'll do. All right. Um, so water comes through our evaporator, and then through the heat exchanger goes to the condenser coil, exchanges heat inside with your your with your little doodads inside of there. Typical refrigeration cycle, you have to remove heat to cool stuff. Um, hope we don't have to go into that here because that's out of my realm. Um, but an air cool would be that way. Whereas a water cooled, you can see all the way over here, right? Hold on. Okay. All right, I'll try and draw a little bit better condenser evaporator setup here. So, this would be our water loop. And then, or let's go rephrase that. C H W. And then this would be our cooling tower. All right, so in this case, we would have, I guess I'll put the pump on the right side since I'll put it over there before. And then, all right, and then this is our condenser water loop. All right, on a liquid cold, oh, you said you can't see up there, huh? All right, on a liquid cooled, same basic principle as the water, as the air cooled, but you're using water to transfer your inner, your heat. In this case, the, the chill water loop goes through the evaporator, evaporator and the condenser do their little doodad wizardry inside of there. Condenser loop water comes through, pulls that heat out, brings it up to another heat exchanger, which then circulates water with air passing over it to draw the temperature out of that to completely reject it out of your system. Um, there are a couple of different kinds of condenser water systems. We won't really go into those because I don't know that much about them. Um, but basically, most of them are going to be constant volume, constant flow type setups. There are a few that will actually maintain flow set with a VFD, but most of them are just on off. Um, Typical condenser water system is going to run like 75 to 85 degrees, depending on the equipment. Um, they usually maintain what, like an eight degree delta on condenser water, something like that? 10? 10. 10. Most of them are under 10, 10. on both sides. Okay, yeah. Um, but yeah, there, there are a couple different kinds of condenser water towers, cooling towers, but I don't know a whole lot about those, so we'll stay out of that. Basic would be closed loop and open loop. Um, open loop, you are actually circulating the same water that goes through your chiller over this heat exchanger. Closed loop, you have a separate loop inside the cooling tower and a heat exchanger. It's the easiest way to explain it. Um, there are some other variables that I, I don't know enough about to describe. Huh? Well, yeah, spray pump, no spray pump, that kind of stuff. Um, but we're going to focus on the chill water side today. Um, so that's our basic air cooled versus chill versus liquid cooled setup. Air cooled is refrigerant being sent to a condenser to, to remove heat with a fan. Liquid cooled is water removes the temperature, the heat, and then transfers it through the air. All the refrigerant cycle is held inside the equipment. And then the, the heat rejection is done outside of it. Um, Okay, 
the next kind of loop we would have. Let's go to page seven, Holden, our classic primary secondary. So on a, let's just call it a classic. I'm only calling it classic because that's what this page calls it. I would just call it a, a constant volume primary secondary, or I guess the this one has a variable speed secondary in the diagram. Um, I can give you all each one of these if you want them. This is actually a really good document. I'm not gonna say who it comes from because you know, but it's a really, really good piece of literature. Um, all right, so let me draw this out. So in a classic, we have a dedicated pump per chiller. Um, oh, something Holden wanted me to touch on. Actually, we'll back up a second. So in a, in a primary loop only setup, your chillers should most of the time have an ISO valve. Um, so in a sequence of operation, like I said, we would, your plant would become active Typically, you are going to open the isolation valve before you even start a pump. Some systems have an in switch on this valve that requires that in switch to make, and then that will start a pump. Um, other systems will start a pump, let it deadhead for a couple of seconds while the valve opens. It, it really just depends on how it was programmed and built. Um, I always recommend having an in switch on here. Open the valve first, then start your pump. That way you don't deadhead. But I mean, in a deadhead scenario, you're talking a couple seconds, maybe a minute max while that valve drives open. As soon as it cracks, you're gonna start having flow. So you're not gonna just sit there and spool the pump all day. That really shouldn't hurt it. Um, but these are important. If this valve is open and this chiller is not running, you will migrate oil out of that evaporator system. Yeah, and you, you add a, a false load to the system by circulating water through that coil because it's still a heat, heat, heat exchange no matter what. Even if it's a minimal one, you're adding a load. Um, but the biggest thing is the migration of oil because you can starve a unit for oil and burn a, burn a compressor up. Um, so always look for these. Um, they can be detrimental to a system. Why do you, why it's funny that you say that because that actually happened to me. That's the one that multi stack. Yeah, that's, I believe that's exactly why that one compressor. That's, you looked in, you look into the site glass, bone dry. Yeah, and there's no oil anywhere around on the floor, nowhere. Yep. Yeah. 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 And yeah. we found we found one of the chill water pumps was gone. I mean, just when I asked you, I'm like, hey, you know this flow looks horrible. How do you verify that you're doing a proper GPM for your chiller when you're running like that? Whole different world. <laughs> it's, it's it's called oh, yeah. Yeah. a water balance so a, a, a tab contractor can do a water balance on the system and actually read flows that they or if you have we have a couple buildings most buildings that are primary secondary are going to have flow meters period because especially if it's a variable volume system like uh we have a few buildings one, one very prestigious customer who i won't name they have a flow meter on each chiller. So I, I modulate the VFD based on that flow meter. Then, then typically it's been set either at the pump with a, with a, a, a circuit setter valve or at the chiller with a, a, some kind of circuit setter. But sometimes they're just a freaking butterfly valve that's cocked at 45 Wait, degrees. <laughs> yeah. Well, a lot of times, if you have more than one pump, your 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 chiller itself is metered, right? Like with some kind of valve or something that, that's preventing too much flow from going through that chiller. And a lot of times, it could be something as simple as a, a butterfly valve with a manual handle on it that's been locked down to a certain so setting. So you add so. Oh, okay. No, come on. No. Well, so like okay. Everything's locked in position. Um, chiller turned off isolation valve, as you said. Um, 
you still have two pumps running with real yep. utility really only have one pump running. But to maintain building uh, differential pressure, they have to have two pumps running. Yeah. So we, we actually have a building. I, I doubt we're talking about the same one, but I have a building that has that same problem. So we have isolation valves. The isolation valves are controlled by the chiller. The chiller is network controlled. So we don't have any physical input to the chiller. All I do is pull it in back net. I say start or enable or disable. Then the chiller does everything on its own. The only thing it doesn't do is start its own pump. It starts its own ISO valve. It controls its own ISO valve. But the pumps are down on the first floor of this six-story building. Yeah. We can we control the pumps. We control the differential pressure with the pumps. I have to have both pumps running in this building to maintain the differential pressure that's required for the air handlers. Yeah. The building will not maintain on one pump. It, it just won't. Right, but the chiller doesn't require both pumps. Right, but the chiller doesn't require both pumps. But we've had issues where the ISO valve won't close or doesn't close. But in this particular setup, there are butterfly valves that have been set by the chiller startup tech because the chillers have flow meters inside of them. So they've closed the valves manually and then put a nut and a bolt in them to lock them in place to set the flow through the chillers. But it, I would just have to see the situation you're talking about. It, it's probably unbalanced. I'll, oh, I know. I'll, I'll, yeah, and I pretty much guarantee it's unbalanced. But we could hire a tab contractor and have them come do a water balance on the system. It's going to be expensive. Do you have triple duty balance? Are those common out there? Not really. But, I mean, we don't have a lot of two-pipe systems. Most of our stuff's four-pipe. You're talking about like a triple duty. You mean, are you talking like the the circuits, one that circuits header, you know, backflow preventer? Okay, okay. So sorry, I'm I'm thinking different. I was thinking like uh, like condenser water, fire fire water, and uh, uh, yeah, you, you know which one I'm talking. About. But no, what? Tri water. Yeah, tri water. Sorry. Horrible. Yeah. Okay. The worst design. Tri water. All right. So we're, we're talking about two different things. So what are you're talking about? Like a valve that is a. Yeah, so triple, it's a. Triple a duty. Most okay. of them are like their B and Gs, and they have the circuit setter coming yeah. out, and mm -hmm. they have the backflow preventers, yep. and and a strainer and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, yeah, we we have a couple of those. Those are nice. Yeah. Yeah. We we typically refer to them as loose flow settings. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, they're nice, but yeah, it's that. just different just terms. Got, I got to learn the vernacular. Again. Looking at that. But yeah, I'll, I'll, most <laughs> most of the time, your your flow is going to be set by that kind of stuff, and usually on startup, right? Like when the chiller is installed, that kind of stuff is done. Now, twenty years down the road, shit's been monkeyed with, things have been moved, valves have been changed. That stuff gets all out of whack, and and the building I'm talking about is definitely has that problem. They actually have two brand new carriers. But the rest of the building is out of whack, right? They they set the chillers for what they needed, but they the rest of the building is out of whack. So that's why we have to run both pumps to maintain the differential on these coils. Because when you look up the manufacturer's info on the coil, it's like an 18 degree differential is what they want, 18 PSI differential. And the only way I can maintain that with how the building is set up is by running both pumps at full speed. It, it will not do it otherwise. I had that happen, and they ended up putting just smaller pumps right at the at all the coils yeah 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 some booster and pumps. Then they were able to shut off the two the two i think they were like 60 or 75 horse they, so they were able to throttle those back down and they just the, used the yeah. individual just the, smaller like B and G series 80s yeah. or 100 yeah the, 100. the building i'm referencing the the issue is they've come back and put so many fan coils in after the fact and and you're you're trunk piping has not changed size right so you're limited yeah. on flow because you you have an eight inch pipe that serves the entire building. Well, it can only do eight inches worth of flow. So the only way to get more differential for what the air handlers need is to, to run both pumps, right? You build pressure instead of flow because really you, you're limited on flow, right? Water can only fits so much water in a, in a tube. It, it you can't compress water like you can air. So you can only fit so much water. So the only thing you can do is increase the, the amount of pressure or head you're putting on the, yeah, the feet of head you're putting on the water to make the basically you're tricking the air handler it's still not running at its most efficient rate even though it has the 18 psi we need on six it still doesn't technically have the flow and the pressure it needs 
What's the what's the normal drop across those, those coils? These are eighteen for some reason. I, I don't. I'm I'm not familiar with all of them. It, I know they hired an engineer to come look at it and tell them what it needed to be set at because when they took this building over, there was no documentation. So they and and as soon as they bought it, they put in these brand new carrier chillers. Carrier came out, set the chillers flow rates right. But then we had to fire both pumps up to get the coils to even make like 60 degree water. I mean, air. They were struggling. The only way we could do it was by running both pumps. And we didn't have a sequence of operation on the building, nothing. So, yeah, right. Yeah, totally. We ripped out an, an old CSI system and put in a, a DISTEC system. So, but we had no base building drawings to go off of, no nothing. So it was. They hired an engineer, and, and the engineer was like, well, versus going and setting every single fan coil that's ever been set in this building, which none of them had circuit setters on. None of them had – they were – somebody would just hot tap the pipe, put in a unit. Like, it's atrocious. So, and luckily for y'all, it's one we don't really do any mechanical on. We only do automation in it. So, but, yeah, it's it's a bit of a nightmare. Every time a fan coil – gets taken out they they basically have told all the tenants y'all can't add any more fan coils so that once they go out they're not coming back and their their thought process is that by removing all these fan coils they're going to fix their system because then they can just go set all the air handlers again well, so yeah, they've have probably more, you'll have more pressure in the building right they've probably removed 20 fan coils over the last five years and you're still running two pumps. So, i'd have to check it i haven't checked it in a while um but yeah, and and they're they're the pumps are not on VFDs either, so that's part of the issue. Constant duty. <laughs> well, it's it's got a bypass valve, All so right. it, that's how we maintain pressure is with the bypass valve. But we have to run both pumps and then modulate the bypass valve. In theory, we should be able to run one pump and modulate the bypass valve, but we can't can't it just doesn't work. Um. All right. So back to this. Let's go. Back to what we were doing here. So in a system like this, we, yes, common header. And then we have decoupler loop or bypass. Okay. So here? Yeah. No. Not on this one. No. So th this is a this is a primary secondary setup with either constant volume pumps or maintaining like a, a set flow point through the chillers. But in this situation, you, you don't have to have a bypass here because it's a dedicated pump per chiller. Yeah, don't they normally have a bypass? Some of them, I guess. Some of them have a bypass in case the pump goes down. They can... No. Uh, I mean, I, 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 I get what you're talking about. Yes, it, it, it could. I've seen some. I, I know what you're referring to. Like, a lot of times what you would have is you would have two pumps like that that feed one chiller. That's more common than having a bypass. So this system would have four pumps, and then I could lead lag each of these pumps based on that chiller. So it, it just depends. Most of the time, though, we, we see more commonly that setup where it's one pump, one chiller, no bypass, no secondary pump, or no, no lag pump. Um, we'll just, to keep it simple, we'll focus on this. But yes, you could have either a bypass or a second pump in just depends on how the system's built. Um, but in this case, because you have a dedicated pump per chiller, most pumps have a backflow preventer, so you don't need an isolation valve. And your pump is going into the chiller, pushing through it. So you have a check valve here that prevents water from going through it if the pump's not running. Um, because it pressurizes this side and pushes through the chiller, and your pressure deadheads right there at the, at the pump. So you don't need an ISO valve in that situation. Um, so that would just be that check valve, I guess, technically. The check valve before or after a pump? After. The after? Oh, so, yeah, so it would be there instead of back here. 
So you would have a check valve before each pump to prevent the water from flowing back through the chiller. Um, in this type of situation, what I was saying is, you know, these pumps would modulate to maintain our flow through the chillers. Then you would have a secondary side with, let's see, I guess you'd have a pump. Comes out the primary. Yeah, here. Um, right, pumps? Yeah, yeah, on the, on the pushing water through your loop, not pulling. So you would have, actually, let's do it this way. Let's go. That's how most of ours are. We would have two pumps on the primary, which can lead lag. Those pumps would be on a VFD that maintain pressure through the building. And then you have a bypass valve that can also open and close. Actually, most of these wouldn't have a bypass valve, but you can, if your pressure in the building gets to a point of where your pumps don't speed up, but you still need to flow, it can take the path of least resistance to this bypass or this decouple loop. Typically, these don't have a valve. So it's using path of least resistance. If, if these aren't drawing the water through, it's going to just push this way, right? Because you can't, this side can't push the water through the pumps because they're only running at a certain speed. So it'll just take and circulate that water through here. High pressure going to low pressure. Right, yeah. Path of least resistance, high pressure over low pressure type deal. So um, you got a flow preventer there too, or check valve there as well? Well, you always have a check valve after the pump. But, huh? Yeah, yeah. That's what yeah, I'm yeah. Those, those are there by, by default on a pump. But you would not have anything on this side, right? Because this water is always going to flow like that. Right. So if, if this is not maintaining enough flow in the secondary, so this, that's your secondary loop right here. So... And then this is your primary loop. The racetrack. Yeah. So this is always maintaining constant flow of whatever it needs. And this system can modulate and vary flow because your air handlers only require differential pressure. They don't technically require have a flow requirement because your flow is going to change as that valve opens and closes, right? So you're, you're, you're truly only maintaining the differential is what you want maintained. You want that pressure drop across the coil. Flow is dependent on the valve position, right? So we can modulate these pumps to maintain that differential. And then if they get down to a certain level, some systems have very few, but some do have a secondary bypass loop on the primary, I mean secondary, but it's like, it's usually a three-way valve. They, they rarely have a, another valve that will open. Usually it's a three-way up at the top or like the top two air handlers have a three-way valve. So you typically won't have a bunch of two-ways and a bypass, but some buildings do. So we did a school a couple years back that had a freaking bypass valve up at the top of the roof, like just a big NEMA 4 Belimo valve just sitting on the roof. We're like, what is this thing for? Then once we started looking at the building, we found out every single air handler had two-way valves. So they had a, a bypass valve up on the top that would open and close to maintain that differential if the pumps couldn't slow down enough. So um, any questions on that? And then we pretty much, we actually already just talked about it, was the variable primary, variable secondary. Um, so that would be where you're like maintaining, what's it say? <laughs> Why do they have... Um, with variable primary, variable secondary, you have uh, more of a, uh, a common header. Yeah. We have a building that's set up that way. We do? Uh, yeah. It's 
got it has an isolator between them, mm -hmm. but they leave closed most of the time. Okay. But uh, technically, it is. Yeah. This, especially when that bypass is open. Yeah. Yeah, this one's just saying bypass with no restrictions, but I guess you're saying that they can they determine if they want to open or close it. I mean, it's kind of what I already just described. So, do you want to, that pretty well covers the loop. Do you want to go into um, system staging for energy efficiency? Probably just because that a little bit of time. Right? As far as chill water? Or just in general, like why we stay. Okay. Yeah, like and resets and stuff like that. Or no, just a literal morning startup, evening shutdown, energy saving staging. I don't follow. So, it runs higher during the day. Uh, like, <laughs> talking about like a night setback type deal? No, no, so it's like in the morning. Morning mm -hmm. warm up? Morning, like a morning warm up. Gonna, uh, we're going to turn on zones one and two at this time, three and four. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we, your your least favorite tri water building? Yeah. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll start with that one. So, no, it's everybody's least favorite. So, uh, so what Holden's referring to is basically like not load shedding. Um, let's just say like load prioritizing would be a good way to refer to it. So say we have a building. I'm draw it top down. That's how I like it with the top down. Um, let's just say we've got, let's go and draw six units in it just to keep things simple. All right, so this unit comes out. And then this one does, well, actually, let's fix that. Core. Is that what yeah. yeah, pretty much. So, do what? Right? Wouldn't it be nice if it was all this simple? It never is. This stuff would look like a spider in a real building. <laughs> okay, so. Just to keep this simple, we'll, we'll, we'll explain. Uh, I'm going to use our, our least favorite water source heat pump building. Uh, so this building has way more than just six units. But let's just say, <laughs> when this building starts up in the morning, and in each, it's actually three floors. And we, we do the floors differently as well. So. Let's see, you can see over here, right, Holden? Yep. All right, so in this building, we have a three-story building. So in the mornings, when this building starts up, let's, I'm gonna use round times. Let's say the building wants to be occupied by 8 a.m., okay? At 6 a.m., we start the top floor first. At seven, we start the second floor. At eight, we start the first floor. So we go going backwards. Highest heat load, next heat load, last heat load, right? Because this building has a ton of water source heat pumps. If we fire them all up at the same time, we risk tripping the main in the building. And we also give their peak energy consumption. Based on their peak energy consumption at any given time sets their energy rate for the month. So like if they draw 600 amps at any given time that puts them over a threshold and ratchets them into the next cost bracket for their electricity. So if we can keep their peak below 600 amps at any given time, we can reduce their energy cost. So if I can stage up in how the building starts, 
rather than throwing it all on at once and bumping 800 amps, if we can stage them up slowly and keep our threshold at like 400, we save them thousands of dollars. Because I mean, it changes like three to five cents per kilowatt hour if it jumps to a next bracket. And you're talking thousands of KWH per, per day. So the cost is pretty substantial. So we stage each, we start with our highest load, and then in the winter, we flip it based on outside air temperature. We would start the first floor first, then the second floor, then the third floor, because it's cold, heat, heat drops, hot rises. Then on the floors, we stage the floors up too. So we would stage the perimeter up first, right? To create an, an envelope, a perimeter of the building. And then as time goes on, we would bring the interiors on. At night, to save energy, they actually completely shut down their interior units and only run the exteriors. So the, their night's program for unoccupancy is any of their interior units are completely off. They do nothing. They don't care what the temperature is. Because as long as they maintain the perimeter, the center will hold temperature. It doesn't rise or fall. It's all based on what is coming into the building. Right, no heat loss or no, or heat gain because you're you're creating a barrier with the outside of the building, so you don't have that thermal dissipation from the windows or air coming in through gaps, stuff like that. So your center, your building holds temperature, whereas the the perimeter does not. So what's your what's your actual time frame for for? Do you do like one hour per? I'd have to look at it. Okay. I'm, I'm just using round numbers. I, I can give you the exact values if you want them. I was I, I don't know them offhand because we did that job That's like smart. You're staging the building. Yeah, so we, we did that job like six years ago. So I don't remember the exact, but I want to say we do we do thirty minutes per floor, and then we actually we we start these in groups when the building fires up. So like we have like an A B C D group, and and they're done by floor, and then each floor may take an hour to start up, based on how many groups we have for the floor. I don't remember exactly. But we, we did, we have a, an energy meter that does like graphing and stuff on their, their main for the building. And we tried it a bunch of different ways. And whatever it is now is what we came up with was the best way to start everything. So I think we may do like five or six units at a time. We let come on per floor, however long it takes to bring all the equipment on to enable. Not, it may not all start up at once because it's it's still maintaining a set point, right. right? So you may, out of five, you may only have three that engage at any one time. But we didn't want them, if you bring on the entire floor, that's still a ton of equipment that could possibly come on at any one time. Is there a safety, like, not safety, but it's kind of a threshold where it's like monitoring it and you're getting close to it, you can kind of both wait, hang on, we're not going to take on these next units yet, or does that not the, They're not because we don't need it. it, it it's the way we... We tested it for so long that we we found out the thresholds. Yeah, it's we're just the numbers are solid. That we minimized our group size on purpose. That way, we'd never cross that threshold. So typically, like let's just say we're bringing on five units, enabling five units. Typically, you only have three that ever start up. But we it, worst case scenario, if all five start at once, it never pushes us over. So once they start, that inrush is gone. We can then immediately go to the next group, right? Because it's they were getting peaks on inrush, not necessarily constant draw, but their inrush was so <coughs> hot because you were starting up so many units and most of that stuff's 28, 277 in that building. So it's low voltage to begin with, so that's higher amp draw on smaller equipment. So if it was 480, then your your inrush would be less because you have higher current capacity. But being that it's, it's low voltage, on we, slow. yeah, on the clock. So, like I was saying, we start this building perimeter first, then we would engage the interior at night when the building is unoccupied. Only this equipment is allowed to run. The interior is not even allowed to run at all. So I think there is actually a threshold that it will come on if it gets certain temperature, but it never. No, no, you can override it all day. Yeah, 100 percent. But like, let's just say these guys have an unoccupied set point of 85. These may be like 95, something crazy high. Right, they that way. I mean, it's Texas yeah. summertime. Eighty-five doesn't feel bad when it's hundred something outside. Exactly, <laughs> but but like so that's that's how we limit the amount of consumption in this building. So in in others where you have like a, let's just say we have a, 
a six story unit uh, building with a bunch of VAV air handlers and fan power boxes. Okay. Same thing. We would stage each floor independently. You're not going to bring all six on at once. You would start the same way. Typically we're going to start with the hot floor in the summer, the cold floor in the winter. Not all buildings are set up that way, but if we have the time and the customers requested it and paid for it, then we can put those algorithms in place. A lot of times they just do it based on what schedule they want. So uh, an engineer can go in our systems and they can set their own schedules. So we, this building has an algorithm built into it because they paid us and engineered it. Other buildings, if they have six floors, they have six schedules. They can in their own way, go in there and determine which building, which floor starts first, which one starts second by changing those schedules. No, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it, it can be any, it, any, any equipment can be done this way on a BAS system, right? Like the, there is no limit to what we can program if you're willing to spend the money on equipment and time, right? Like we can do all kinds of algorithms. It's That's just smart what, it's a smart way to do it. Yeah, I mean, well, like I said, in, in this building that I'm referencing, they don't have to do anything. It looks at outside air temperature, it looks at space temperature, and it determines on its own what it starts first. In a typical building, which, you know, just let's just say a typical standard six floor, six <laughs> floors, you know, each floor is going to have its own, its own schedule. He may start this one at five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10 a.m. You know, I mean, they're not that, but the building engineer would determine which one of those comes on based on the schedule. Whereas in this building, we know we want the building running by eight o'clock. We do look through all the this these variables and determine what has to happen in order to start that building by eight o'clock to have it at temperature. So if it's super hot outside, it's going to start earlier. We call it optimized start stop. Is is what the the algorithm is called. You're optimizing the time you start your equipment in order to be at set point by the time it's occupied. So the yeah. Right. Yep. Would you ever use the derivative for a situation like that? An optimized start stop doesn't need it because it's not a true pit algorithm, sure. right? It's 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 not a proportional output in in like like if I had a hundred units and I wanted to say start them at a certain speed, then I could use a per, a pit. But this is more of a hey, if outside air temp is this much, we want to start the schedule at this time. It, it's it's more of a basic. yeah. It's it's a lot more basic program than a pit algorithm because a pit is proportional. This is like only got like five different steps or something like that it's not super super because that you're talking when you've got 150 some odd units and you're trying to get all that logic it just it grows and grows and grows and grows and it just gets crazy um so we try to limit how crazy it gets it can look like some rocket ship stuff um but yeah like most high rises are going to be in, in this scenario where even if they do have and an algorithm for optimized start stop it's still going to be on a by floor basis right like so the engineer is going to say i want this floor to be occupied by six i want this floor to be occupied by seven i want this floor to be occupied by eight and it's not it's going to be like eight eight fifteen eight thirty eight forty five like that kind of stuff because they don't want it taking four hours to start a building and the other thing is when you when you stage stuff like this you don't slam your central plant equipment with load either it's another reason we do it because if you bring on six floors worth of load at one time, you're going to hammer your central plant, right? And in a central plant, yeah, so when when we start, let's just, we'll, we'll go two chillers just to make life easy. Um, so let's just say, here's our air handler, and we'll just do two VAV boxes off of it. We have a schedule. Am I too high, Holden? Let's just go, all right, okay, let's just do, so this is our, our schedule, right? With this schedule is telling this equipment to start. Once this equipment starts, it's gonna tell our central plant over here that, hey, I have a request for cooling. I need a chiller. So then a chiller is gonna start up well, on startup, we give this chiller X amount of time to get the loop down before we bring on our lag chiller, right? So if if our if we don't have an initial delay on startup, 
it would instantly fire up both chillers because let's say we're lagging based on return temp. As soon as those pumps turn on, the system's enabled, they see a return temp of 75 degrees because the system stagnated overnight. Oh, I need both chillers. Well, in reality, you don't because you have a false load. So you would wait like an hour, 45 minutes, whatever. It just depends on the system before you would start the second chiller on initial startup. So if you bring on all that equipment at one time, A, you're never going to get that loop down. And you would overrun that initial timer and call on for the entire plant, which you don't really need because if you'd staged equipment on, you could have maintained the load on one chiller. Whereas instead of bringing everything on at once, you're throwing on, you know, 400 tons worth of cooling immediately, you've got two 200 ton units, you're going to need them both. Whereas if you let the 200 tons stage up based on the equipment, you can reduce that load once, because your building is going to cool down quickly with no human load in it, right? right. So, yeah, yeah. You're, you don't, you don't truly need fast. both chillers. You really you only need one, off. right? It, as soon as the loop drops back down below 50 degrees on the return, it's going to drop that chiller off. You just ran that chiller an hour for no reason when you could have just run this chiller for that hour and it would have caught up because you slowly brought in your building. And it's running the sink. If they maintain that chill water yeah. point a lot easier. Yep. Do you ever do the, the voting, you know, like mm -hmm. the yeah. train has the voting and all that? So voting, <coughs> we don't do it for chillers, but for like uh VRFs, multi zones, th yeah, those. It's more on the air side. Yeah, I, I it's, I've ever yeah. seen anything on water. Side, um, we do do serious. we do voting for after hours air control, okay. or averaging. It can be, you can use both setups, right? You can do. So typically, we'll do what we call a weighted average. So, you don't want to say you've got fifty VAV boxes. Okay, you don't want to bring on your entire floor and your central plant because one VAV box got to eighty five degrees. You want half your floor to be at 55 degrees. So you can do a voting or a polling method where you need a, a, a certain percentage. A, so each, each VAV box gives us a, a demand, right? It's called terminal load. So we can either use the terminal load, we can use which terminal load is deviation from set point basically. And, and the further away you are from set point, the higher your terminal load is gonna be. So we can look at terminal load and, and bring those in and calculate it based on that. Or we can just look at pure space temperature and do an average and bring them on that way. Or we can, some boxes will automatically come on and activate themselves in what they call a bypass mode or a, an unoccupied command. And we can say, all right, I've got five out of 25 boxes in bypass, bring on an air handler, right? And then once an air handler starts, a central plant starts, so forth. It just, there's a couple different ways and it's really based on the systems like JCI's logic works one way, Honeywell's logic works another way. And, and each person also writes individually, right? Like the way I write logic versus the way Kevin or other guy writes logic is, is different. It's still the same thing, but we, we just take different paths. So he may write something a little bit differently than me and I may write something a little bit differently than him. And then I may write differently than the next guy, you know? It's, is there any ways to give like I mean what are the, I mean obviously we're not going to go into super long detail but it's like a, a couple little short little pros and cons to each. There's not really they, 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 they all that. equate to the same thing right because if you think about it whether you're averaging space temperatures okay and you know hey I want my building to come on at 85 degrees well you're going to have an 85 degree unoccupied set point on all those boxes anyway so you can do an average at that point or you can go look at the load on the boxes. They're all set to 85 degrees. Their load is going to increase when they get above 85 degrees. So you lose the load to bring it on. Or you use the, the bypass function where the box occupies itself. You're monitoring that occupancy or not occupancy, but mode. And then you bring on equipment, right? It, they all do the same thing. It's just different paths to get to the same thing. Yeah, the same. Right. Yeah. Because it, think about it. If you're, whether I'm averaging five different, let's say 10 different items, right? You've got 10 different sensors and you're averaging them or you are taking the load from 10 different boxes, it, it, it's, it's basically the same thing. 
you're just doing a different little bit of logic, right? Like one, you're looking at the terminal load of the box. One, you're looking at the space temperatures. It, the difference in, in using like a space temperature function would be that you would then more times than not, I'm trying to think how to explain this to make it make sense. So if, if we're using temperature only, you can't guarantee that every box is going to be in, is going to be requesting cooling, right? Whereas if you use the load and you get to a load percentage, then you're going to know that your boxes are in a load truly, right? Like regardless of their set point, if somebody has changed an unoccupied set point, it's still in a load, right? Like it, it knows what its load is versus you having to guess what its load is just based on temperature. Well, that sounds more efficient since you wouldn't uh, short cycle your equipment either. Well, it is, but it isn't because if you're just, so the load is based on deviation from set point, right? If you've got a global set point and every single box is set to 85 degrees, then you can do different, you can do temperature all day because you know every single box is set to 85 degrees. But if you change that unoccupied set point in every box or half the boxes, well, that, that 85 degree set point is no longer valid. You would have to adjust that set point, right? Whereas if you have load based, you can change all the temperature set points in the boxes all you want. All you care about is the load of the equipment. So that's our preferred way to do it. Okay. We use load, not averages. Um, averages work just fine. It just, you have to be more, you have to pay more attention to what you're setting the building as. If you're using a global set point for the entire building, they work perfectly fine. If you've got, one customer, hey, we can't have it any higher than 80 degrees in our space. And another customer that's like, screw it, 90 is fine. Then you wouldn't want to do temperature based averages, right? You'd want to do load based averages because we want this space to come on if it gets to 80. So mm -hmm. you can have this whole side set for 85 for load, this whole side set for 80 for load. Yes, they're both going to be, they're not going to call at the same time because their set points are different. But based on load, this side's going to load up faster mm -hmm. than this side would. So it's right. it's the pref it's the our preferred way, and it's how most stuff is done. And then the the monitoring the mode of equipment works the same way as well. So if if you're monitoring the modes, like so, say you have ten boxes, and we get out of them, which we get occupied, unoccupied, and bypass. Right, like bypass can either be if somebody's pushed a button to bring the equipment on or it has come on in unoccupancy and, for, and is calling for cooling. So we monitor that change of state in the box. If we get five boxes that are in bypass, we know we need to start equipment because they have reached their load limit and gone into occupancy or bypass. So those two truly work the same way. Okay. Um, but what you can do also is we do a weighted average or a weighted voting policy, policy where like you will take your five hottest boxes, right? And, or most crucial boxes, like say you've got like the CEO's office or something like that. And you can bring those, those in with a higher priority. Or if you have a space that you know needs cooling more than others, those can give a higher priority and we can weight their, their average or their. Like a UPS room or something Right. Like yeah. I mean, but those typically have, have, have separate cooling in them. Um, but like you can give them a higher priority by waiting their average or waiting their call that way. Like, all right, so yeah, we only have five boxes, but three of them are of this space, which are a higher priority. So even though we're not at five, those three actually equal six because we've doubled their, their, their vote, right? We've given them two votes in the system instead of one vote, basically. So we can bring on that equipment sooner because that space is a higher priority by waiting the average of that. And a lot of buildings get that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. If a building is specifically facing a certain way and gets a lot of solar load, we can do that. So. I'm done. <laughs> Cut. Sit. Go home. Get your microphone.